Boys and Girls, welcome to this week's episode of Hollow Weekly. Nick and George here with Split Decision, Split Decision, Splitsville, <laughs> USA. That's what we should call this one. <laughs> well, no, I got some foreign. Oh wait, no, I don't. Never mind. I dropped the foreign film before, but uh, so just so just Split. Just We're Split. Gonna, well, I was literally, I was thinking of it. Remember that line from Oz, "The Great and Terrible." I was thinking of it as the Great and Terrible because the idea for the episode. Like, oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah is yeah. going to be horror movies that were both great and terrible simultaneously, or had at least one great thing balanced against one terrible thing in the movie. So I kept hearing great and terrible odds. Does that head. mean if those films would, would they pass? What is it? Anubis in the afterlife when they balance, they would not pass. They, they would No, they would have to stay in limbo until they got rid of the terrible part, which they should. But, have done I mean, but some of them are equal. Production anyway. but some of them are equal. Like I got a few on my list. That I'm pretty sure would. You think they're going to even out? Well, we'll f- I think, I think they'll even out. We'll find out. Actually, enough. we got to give a shout out to the group. Cause someone had posted in our Facebook group, um, a movie that was both great and terrible simultaneously and gave us the idea for the episode. So, <laughs> and we're actually going to read off some of the group answers. We posed this question to the group, like what's the first horror movie that you think of that's both great and t- terrible simultaneously. And we got some great answers. So we'll read them off after we cover our list. Yeah, I will. I will kick this off. There's one film. It's funny. The for my first wait before three. you kick it off, I just got to say, so first, even though I came up with the idea for this episode, based on the group post. I shouldn't have in retrospect because I feel like I'm going to make no friends with my choices <laughs> this episode. I'm going to cause a this, lot of trouble. But right, so yeah, no, but this episode's not about French. No, it's clearly it's not. About, it's about keep it's about right. creeping it real. Yes, yes, exactly. Hashtag creeping it real because I my choices are not going to please anyone. But but regardless, I'm excited to hear what you got because I have a feeling you're going to the, the great thing is is that it's, you know, we don't trash films because that's not helpful to anyone True. and boring. True. But there are, there are some things that we wish were a little bit better, but they <laughs> bounce them up with some pretty decent things. So yes. like exactly. th- my, I guess, I guess the subtitle <laughs> for this episode would be life could be a lot worse. <laughs> exactly right. But exactly. it's not, but it's not. Okay. Well, I'll kick off the list here. We did an entire episode on actually my first three, but I feel so strongly about them. Like I feel like they're, it's a donut. With a lack of jelly in it. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Plus, I have a feeling some of these episodes are very old in our back catalog. Yeah, so. yeah. So the first one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit up with Late Phases. <laughs> and I'm bl- this was the most surprising entry on your list to me. To you? Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I, I just, I, I love Good Bad Flicks' channel. We had him on the show. Cecil, great, great interview, great person. Yep. I love what he's doing. Uh, but he gave this film such good praises that I was like, George... My by God, we have to watch this werewolf <laughs> T- movie. Totally, because we haven't gotten a great werewolf film in a good while. Yeah, we actually put this up on Twitter. We were like, it seems like it seems like good werewolf film, films move in like four year cycles, right? Yeah. So like, Wolfman was 2010, and then Wolf Cop was 2014, among some others, and then here we are, 2018. With, we're due for a with, good. We're due for another uh, another good one, at least, but great ones. I don't even know. It's been quite a while, so. Yeah, but Late Phases sold me on just the premise of mm-hmm. a blind veteran in a, in a retirement home and then werewolves attack, and it's like sort of home alone uh, type shit. Totally. And that, that, that sold me instantly. I was I was fully expecting to love Late Phases when we walked into it. Yeah. Great cast, great concept werewolf movie i was on board and then it just it just wasn't there <laughs> like i can't just i can't just right but it. we kind of went after this movie with both claws when we reviewed it initially so now yeah. i'm really curious what great thing you're juxtaposing for against. me i think i think i think conceptually i think it's great so like, the concept of the movie like here's okay. the deal if, if late phases wasn't a film and like say you and i were hanging out shooting the breeze and talk, you know, you know, horror fans they they, they talk about certain scenarios and shit like that. Like, sure. what would you do if I said, "Hey, man," <laughs> I would. I don't know why I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume we're blind, but I would. But I would take the idea of like, what would you do if like a like a series of werewolves were attacking your house? Like, how would you defend it? Right. Because I think that's a great conversation. Yes. And I think ideally that makes a great movie. To- totally. And I and honestly, I think the main the main lead performance is is pretty solid in that film. Yeah. I tra- I feel so bad because Robert Kurtzman did the werewolf design mm-hmm. he also did the brazis for yoga hosers and um the, tu- the uh, tusk uh, the walrus mm-hmm. 
And, and I, he's in that really cool Monster Squad book. I was. And I think about. he just did Robert England's new makeup for the Goldbergs. Uh, the Goldbergs. Nice. But I trashed the werewolf design <laughs> because I just thought. Here's the thing. It's pretty I, bad. It, it, the faces. Yes. I think the face still looks a little weird to me, but the body actually looks on point. The yeah, whole. that's actually true. Now that I think about it. Yeah, like, yeah, the, it like was, everything but the yep, face yep. looked great. And I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because, let's be honest, the werewolf design in Bad Moon isn't fantastic either. He seems to... He's one of those boxing werewolves. Yeah. That has I the like, huge toothy mouth but loves to throw punches. But I, but that reason, worked so. for me for some reason. I don't know <laughs> right. I don't know why. I like. Right. But, I, but I'll forgive her for that movie, but not here. It makes me a little bit of a hypocrite. All right, so I'm still on I'll board. Admit, yeah, keep, I'm, a, I'm a little... Keep selling me. I'm a little bit. Um... But that, I mean, really, my, my, my good side is concept. Yes. Uh, lead actor. Right. And they. All sur- the acting was pretty good in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Except for when they shot the moon. That's what we tell the episode. Well, <laughs> shoot the moon. <laughs> shoot the moon. Well, that was, I mean, how are you going to act that? That was pretty terrible. But okay, go ahead. Um, but I, I, there was just something story wise that I think we. Uh, talked about in the, in the in the episode there was just there was just something that was missing that i still don't know if i can put my finger on i just know upon watching it the first time it wasn't there yes and and i, I re-watched it because i was so stunned at because we had posted about that we were going to review that movie to our our facebook page and we had gotten a lot of excited people who were like i love that movie and i was like i am i like i gotta re-watch this yeah and rewatching it, I mean, I still on the second, I didn't. I felt like all the things we had said on the first one still held true for me. But I, you know, I, you're absolutely right. I think that there. Remember, because one of my measurements for movies is like the memory of it. There are scenes in that movie that still stick with me. Yeah, which is a good sign, right? That there's some cool stuff going on there, and maybe some scenes stuck with me for not that great a reason, like the bus traveling scenes. For oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I could think of was a bus. <laughs> I don't know why that kept happening over and over. But okay, so what's the best thing about the movie? It's the that in it, not the concept. Like best in it, is it the acting? Is it acting kills? Is it? I think it's acting. I don't think the acting. kills. I don't think the creatures. Okay, do anything. But I think I think the acting and the concept are really strong. Okay, for, for that film. Fair enough. I like it. So, so that's, late phases, two legged stool. If someone said, if someone said, hey, we're going to mulligan, we're going to redo late phases. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just like, okay, just go for it. Because the concept is just so bitching. <laughs> yeah, like, to- just, no. just do it again. I totally agree. Like, I loved the community. I love trying to figure out who in a community is in on it or not. It's one of the things I loved about Silver Bullet. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that kind of like, the, it's like you said, the home alone part where like someone who has like a skill that they possessed in his case, it's because he was a veteran, I Mm -hmm. think, and they don't get to use those skills anymore, but then they get that one last hurrah where they get to pull out those skills. They, they knew. Yeah. I love that story. Like, that's great. It's all great. I just, there's just something that I still, (laughs) like, I don't know what, there's just like 40 werewolf movies that are better than late. It's like, it's like when you have an edible and you eat an entire pizza and you go, I'm still hungry. (laughs) Like, I shouldn't, that's exactly, I shouldn't be hungry. (laughs) Well, late phases leaves you hungry. That's the (laughs) the poster. That's the, the, the evil world poster for that movie. Yeah. Well, don't worry about it because I'm about to like slash and burn and cause all kinds of enemies with my kickoff choice. Watch all right, you watch, the, watch the controversy. All right, here we go. 1931 Dracula. <laughs> both, no, I can both great and terrible. Now, this is, but hear me out because I have I a, can I can sort of I I have an idea of where you're going. Okay. Keep going. See okay, okay, okay. I don't want to say it because I. Okay, I'm so not, so hear me out on this one. Like I know there's gonna be skepticism. It's a classic. It's a you know, it's a great movie. Um, but I was looking for movies that had a great and terrible element, right? So, uh. so, so I was like, what, can, what, what movie was seemed in balance to me? And and this was one of the first ones that came to mind, which is weird because it's a lot, I love this movie. It's one of my must watch for Halloween because it's one of the very first movies I saw as a kid that was a horror film, and I still love it to this day. But <laughs> here we out of this argument, Dracula. Might not even be the best Dracula movie of 1931. Okay, the Spanish Dracula yeah, version a, of Dracula might be better than Dracula. That's a common, except yeah. for the lead performance, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I buy that entirely. I I think that the camera work in the Spanish one is is definitely livelier and more creative. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I feel like there's some moments where the regular film critic thing of the Spanish one is better than the English one fails as an argument because it's actually creepier when Bella's not moving or the camera's not moving and doing creative stuff and it's just focused on his performance because he's so damn good. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I'm not saying that it's better, but it, I'm saying that it's in play. Yeah. <laughs> that Dracula's not the best Dracula movie of the own year it was in. they were right? shot like... In the, what, then, yeah, they shot Dracula in the morning and they shot the Spanish <laughs> one at night on the same sets with the same you know, equipment. Why isn't like that, that a movie? Like that, that's totally, it should be like Edward too. Yeah, it feels like I would I, see that movie. I would definitely see that movie. Um, but so, so there's that, right? But then the other thing is they asked, um, I, I think his name is David Manners. They asked one of the, the lead actors in Dracula, um, about what it was like to work with Todd Browning. And his answer was boils down to who? <laughs> and he goes, I didn't even see Todd Browning. Like Carl Freund, the cinematographer did all the directing. He's like, I don't know where Todd Browning was. He was like, it's one of the most disorganized movie shoots I've ever been on in my life. Right. This movie was a hot mess while it was getting made. And yeah. there are some really clunky errors. There's some very illogical things going on. I feel like half the time I'm watching shots and it edits and it seems like the director's drunk, which turns out was totally true. And like asleep in his chair drunk. Like this is real, right? And then the cinematographer has to cut, take over and do some stuff. Um, and and I, it's, it's a weird mix to me of, because I feel like the movie sort of lies flat in a yeah. lot of stretches of it. First of all, compared to the other classics that it's around. So compared to like Frankenstein, Wolfman, you know, Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's sort of outclassed in terms of just movie craft as a whole. Mm -hmm. Not, not the, like, I'll get to the great stuff. Because remember, it's got to be great. got to be balanced. Right got to be balanced. So, so that, there's that. But then also against other vampire movies. Like, like when you look at something that's like so uh, I don't it's a, I don't even, this is a bad word to describe this but like bouncy and creative like Bram Stoker's Dracula yeah the, the this movie just sits there for a lot of its run it's true <laughs> right so it feels like a stage play yeah I, right exactly so I feel like this movie has a lot more terrible in it than people are willing to say out loud or admit right so I'm, yeah they feel like if they say it they're like you're not a real horror fan right but like you can <laughs> well, yeah, yourself, well, right. that's not gonna hurt you. It's not gonna hurt to be honest. <laughs> no, and you can feel totally different. That's also fair. I just, I just, yeah. it was. It's to me. It's it's got more flaws than the other Universal Mount Rushmore movies up there, like Invisible Man, Wolfman, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, in terms of even like the secondary performances, which a lot of those I don't feel like are even that strong. I, you know, it, it's that. But then let's get to the fun part because. The greatness that balances out, obviously, the Spanish Dracula is automatic fail against Bella's performance. Like, no yeah. one nailed Dracula the way Bella did. So, his performance is just absolutely magnificent. And the movie is gorgeous. I swear to God, when I saw that thing, first of all, as a kid and then as a teenager, I felt like fog was coming out of the screen. Like, it yeah. was just, and not even just the Wolfman style, because. The Wolfman fog was really like that. Wolfman played more like a mystery to me, or at least mm -hmm. my my kid brain when I was first seeing these things. Dracula, the fog came out, and I wouldn't want to touch it because <laughs> it seemed kind of poisonous. Like yeah. something bad was happening, like just in the atmosphere. more a little bit more dangerous, right? Like like Shakespeare, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> like there's something rotten in the state of this movie. Like don't go in that building, don't go over there. What are you guys doing? Like what? It had all of that, those great elements. The cinematography is just absolutely gorgeous. And even kind of like be for being one of the first horror talkies, like the the way that it's where it doesn't have music and 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 where there's like just eerie silences. There's this amazing scene where I watched a side by side comparison of the Spanish one where um I forget if it's Mina or Lucy goes to attack someone. And in the Spanish one, uh, Lupita, the actress who's magnificent, actually, she goes and just straight up bites the person on the neck. Mm -hmm. In Todd Browning's or Carl Warren's more accurately, <laughs> her eyes get all like this weird glow in them. And then she heads towards the camera and vanishes. And you don't see anything but like the top of her head. And it's 
creepier yeah. than the other way, right? So, like, it's just, but it's just gorgeous. Like, she looks possessed for real. Mm-hmm. So, it's just a gorgeous movie with great performances. So, that, we don't need to, everyone knows this about this movie. But I just wanted to start with. That's, um, a, that's a fair assessment, though. Yeah. Like, that's, no one's going to be like, what? That film from 1931 when they were still trying to figure out how the <laughs> fuck to make movies? <laughs> Wasn't well, perfect. James Whale well seemed to figure it out like right away. But I mean, you know, that's the thing is, it, I feel like it, it it's kind of an insult to the directors who give like blood, sweat, and tears to it to say that you can have make a flawless masterpiece, no terrible things in it, while you're just kind of sleeping in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my controversial first going. Go. What's your next? All right. So second one. I, I don't know what it is about this movie that I just wish worked. Like, it had a cool trailer, cool concept, cool setting, but I didn't give a shit about any of the characters, and that's The Gallows. I don't oh, know. I gallows. don't know why. I don't. It's like, it's like. You really want this movie to work. I wanted this movie to be bomb.com. Actually, I don't know if I even wanted it to be bomb.com. I just wanted it to be good. Right. Like, right. Not terrible. Yeah, because I remember that first trailer of the girl. You know, sitting there trying to cover her head when it, you know, it was all red, mm-hmm. and then you see the person come up behind her, and she gets the rope around the neck and dragged down the stairs. Like, that was a great trailer. Yes, totally. And, and, st- and still, like, the concept of it of school play goes horribly wrong, and mm-hmm. then that person sort of haunts the school is cool. It feels a little R.L. Stein. Like, it feels. Sure. Like, but it's, it's, a, it's a cool, creepy concept. Yes. And the other thing is, you know, we're talking about, like, how you see the film. Or not now you see the film, but like just where you're at mindset wise with the film. Totally. And for me, I remember my friends, my next door neighbors. Their 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 dad was a principal at our elementary school. So he would when he would go to do like some office work or some shit like that, we would go with them, and we would just play around in the school when it was completely empty. Right. And so like I I I know what that feeling of like being in a completely big empty school feels like. It's fucking terrifying. Totally. In fact, I remember strange little tidbit is the he would he would open the door to let us in. And it's completely dark, and he had it was like a timer, like you had to go and turn on the lights within a certain amount of time mm-hmm. or something like that. Or that's how I remember it. Right. So we would run into the gymnasium while it was completely batshit dark, <laughs> and just run around. <laughs> and it was fun, but it was also like really fucking terrifying at the same time. Sure. Because it's a big empty place and everything's echoing. So the setting is great. Yes. It's absolutely great. And it could have led to a franchise because that setting isn't overdone. You don't see that a lot. No, I mean, seriously, like the last film that took place in a school that was scary that I can think of, if it's not Scream, it's The Faculty. Right. Like, that's, that's it. That's the first movie I thought of, too. Yeah, I, and, that, and that's it. And like mm-hmm. that scene when they're in the gymnasium and the, the uh, bleachers I mean, you think of scenes from like Nightmare on Elm Street, like the hallway scene and stuff like that, but it's it's, it's a this little is different. the whole setting is yeah. here. Is, right. Yeah, it's 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 different. And, totally. And I just, I really feel like the gallows could have done something right. But like, as we said in the it episode. It did one thing right. It made $100 billion. Yeah, it made, <laughs> it was like, I think it was 100000 according to its Wikipedia page, $100,000 budget. And then it made like a bunch like of money. 68 million. Yeah, it was, it was a crazy thing. good for them. Yes. Uh, so so that so that's what I liked about it. I liked I liked the concept. I liked the, I even liked the killer. Like he used a rope. Like that's unique, and he tried to like hang people up. And in fact, there was certain. Scenes... I felt like they were convinced they had a new horror villain, like Happy yes. Death Day style. They knew that they had just created something. They were wrong, but they knew it was it was it was it was it was like one hundred percent fake confidence yeah they were like absolutely <laughs> believe me you're gonna love this horror you're gonna love this horror film believe me he's the scariest horror film of all time and then you're like what's right. he do he hangs people what's he look like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he hangs people like i just told you that yeah but what does he look like we don't know you're not gonna really see okay okay that's sure whatever right so but i think but you know this was this was a a cheap found footage horror film that did i think and honestly for being found footage i thought a lot of the cinematography was actually pretty good Mm -hmm. i thought it was really scary i thought this the school setting was really good especially like when they ran like into the office and then into a back office Mm -hmm. and then they had the tv there playing the play Mm mm-hmm on VHS, like that was really cool. Sure. So that's what I think it did well. I think I think the setting they did well. I think the cinematography they did well. The idea for the killer, I still think, was pretty cool. Right. Uh, up until showing him. Up yes. until the showing yep. of him. Where it failed was 
us not really care. There was not a character I really cared about. No. For me, it was it was uh, the story was pretty weak sauce. Yep. Um, I just I just I mean, oh honestly, my god! And then there was these unnecessary complications about who was related to who and who was continuing. Oh my to gosh! Of evil and all that crap was. Uh, yeah, that was that was pretty that was pretty weak. That was there wasn't a lot of cool kills. Because there's really only one way you can hang <laughs> someone, <laughs> so that's. It's kind of, it's a little, I feel like they kind of discovered that halfway into it, and then we're like, oh, like it's okay. gonna be really gory, really <laughs> scary. There's gonna be a lot of creative kills. Like what? He's, well, he's gonna hang the first person. Okay, then what's gonna happen? All right, then he's gonna hang the second. <laughs> Second person. Hear me out, hear me out. And then the third time, the rope's going to come from nowhere above. Wait, we did that last time. All right, below. But it, but Wait, then, gravity doesn't work that way. Okay, it's gonna above. Hang, it's going to hang him. That's four hangings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm at a renaissance fair. Like, it's of, like pulled up to a drive through menu, and, you, and you're like, they're like, do you want a number one, two, three, or four? And you're like, they're all the same. They're all cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> so just pick a random... Yeah. Just pick a random one. <laughs> That's where the film right, gets a little, fair, fair a little weak. There's just something... Because, you know, we, we read the behind the scenes with the directors and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they weren't even, like, big horror fans. No. You know? They were big money fans. <laughs> Which is fine. It's fine. Absolutely. Make yeah. all the make all the money, honey. Totally. I'm down for it. Yep. But if they, you know, now that they got all the money, if they wanted to, hire a writer <laughs> to do a Gallows too. Because, you know, we're in this weird phase where, like, sequels are starting to get better than the yeah. originals. Like, with Annabelle Creation yeah. and the Ouija. Ouija. yep. Yeah. Maybe the Gallows too. Yeah. That, I mean, I'm that's just saying. Fair. That's totally I'm fair. just saying. You could do it. We know you got the Maybe money. Maybe they tried. Maybe they accidentally hang, hung them. They were like, just, just you know what? Yeah, they, they totally wrote themselves in a corner. Uh, They're like, okay. Well, no, I there's hang. a way out of that. Someone can figure it out. A good writer can figure it out. Yeah. So, the, so the gal is. It's got a lot of. Speaking bad of good writers, writer. watch the hard turn we take here oh, <laughs> with, with my choice. Holy crap! I didn't realize how this was going to stack up because I I started really old, so I wanted to do really recent, so that the yeah. whole episode didn't smell like mothballs. Most of us are pretty recent. Okay, cool. No, yeah, you're you're that's good. But so. I was going with um, the recent Netflix drop, Hold the Dark, right? Mm -hmm. Which is about as intellectual and art filmy as you can get, which next to the gallows is just like blowing my mind right now. I'm trying to juggle these two. But so Hold the Dark is by the director of uh, Blue Ruin and Green Room. And it has a fantastic cast. It's got Jeffrey Wright, who's the star. He's the guy from Westworld uh, plays Anthony Hopkins assistant and a million other things. Um, And it's, it's a really intense, really bleak movie. And it is one of the most gorgeous movies I have seen in the last, like I'd say five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is absolutely ravishing how it's shot. I could not take my eyes off of it. Like the even mundane moments in the movie. There's there, and then I heard that this director um, got he's he's the one who's been tapped to do True Detective season three, uh. and and this is a really really quiet movie. But in the middle of it, there's this unbelievable gunfight. That's gunfight sequence that's just violent and loud and fast and badass. And it's like a it's like a quiet take on the T two gunfight when he. He's oh, yeah, in the yeah, building yeah, yeah. and he shoots all the cops. I mean, it's sort of similar. Like how stage, I'm surprised if it wasn't in his head. But the fact that even he was, he put a little T2 in like this quiet art film was just like so ballsy and like whatever. And it would just be amazing. I'm a huge fan of his. Green Room is one of my favorite movies uh, of all time now. So like, yeah, I really wanted to really like this. And the only thing holding it back is it's fucking so terrible writing <laughs> like just jaw droppingly terrible writing who I, wrote it i can't believe i i don't know because like, i didn't even want to know because like, like i don't want to no it's it's it was it was written by i forget his name but it was written by a, a frequent collaborator of uh i can't say his guy's name right jeremy selling or whatever you say his name he's the director um and it's based on a book by a guy named william giraldi who is uh, the book's really good. It's really well written. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those. It's an artier, quiet like Cormac McCarthy kind of book. So it's it's a little you know it can drag and get a little slow. It's got great descriptions, but it's a really smart, really kind of clever story. So I was down for it. I love slow burns. We you know it, it, we love Hereditary. Like we were, we, I was all ready for whatever. But there are Nick. 
I, <laughs> you should have seen me. The movie is so serious, right? And there's these moments where they're leading up to these serious moments. And then they bust out like the seri- the most serious, epically serious line. And I couldn't even see the because line? I was like, it happened line. There were like 10 times this happened uh, where geez. they would bust out this philosophy line in the middle of what was happening. And I couldn't see because I was laughing so hard from the way the lines were delivered and Felt what they try meant. hard. Oh my God. There were like metaphors stacked on metaphors stacked on metaphors. It was like you're the turtle of metaphors. It was like crazy. Yeah, and simmer down. Yeah, and, right. Exactly. There was, I'll give you an example. This is actually not. This is a bad example because it's the first thing that popped in my head when it asked me, and it's a good line, but it'll give you a taste. I thought it was a good line, but it'll give you a taste of of if you, if it wasn't good, how it go bad because of how heavy and sort of pretentious it is, mm-hmm. right? So like this this the the plot of it. I'm not going to go through the whole plot, but the 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 basic plot is this woman has has seemingly lost her child to a pack of wolves in Alaska. They live in kind of a remote Alaska yeah. area. She reaches out to this retired naturalist who wrote a book about how he spent a year with wolves, and she thinks that he can track the wolf that killed her son and get her some answers, maybe get her some revenge. That's that's yeah. the setup for it, right? So he flies out and he meets her, and then he's talking to her, and he goes, you know, I. I was, I stayed in, uh, you know, he, she's like, if you, something about like, if you've been to Alaska before or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I was, I stayed in Anchorage last year. And she's like, that city is not Alaska. Oh, <laughs> right. So it's that, I mean, it's okay, but it gets way worse than that as it goes on. There's these, these, be- like, there's these beats. Go, you're right. <laughs> that city in Alaska was it's not, not Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> right. I get it's supposed to be, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. urban and they're in the rural and like whatever, but it was so on the nose and it happened over and over again. And there were just moments where, where like the, the, the villain slash hero who I'm not going to spoil there's a moment where they gear up to do some serious killing, and it's actually a pretty cool sequence. But before they do it, they have to put on this wooden wolf mask. And it's like, they have to. <laughs> well, apparently, because the because the line he says is, "Sometimes you just got to let the wolf out." <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what is happening? How is this movie so bad and good at the same time? I, I feel like, like that's something. A 90s character would say, go into the bathroom. Like <laughs> right? A buddy cop film. He looks at his partner and goes, sometimes you just gotta let the wolf out. <laughs> like Gary Busey said this to like Eddie Murphy at some point. Like, like, what the hell? So so it's just a gorgeous movie. And a lot of people complain that it's boring. I didn't find it boring. I think one of the strengths of the movie was, even though not a lot was happening in in big stretches of it, it was not boring. Like the, it, they, they kept the tension so high and the stakes were real. You cared about a lot of the characters that you were introduced to. There's a guy who plays um, a native um, yeah, Indian, and and he's the one who initiates sort of the gunfight scene. And he's just an unbelievably great actor. Like all of it was. There's great acting, great cinematography, and then the writing is just so abysmal in parts i was like how did this make it into this movie? i just keep imagining that line like instead of like what if he just said sometimes you just gotta wear a wooden wolf mask like that would make more sense like all right, well. and it really it got to me at the end like when you think through the implications of because i didn't realize i thought i was watching a thriller about a real wolf pack and basically it is the werewolf movie we're waiting for it might be the best oh. werewolf movie of 2018, but it's secret. It's in disguise, which is actually kind of cool. So it's got all this going on for it and like really great sequences and magnificent acting. And then just get some this, lines in there that are. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just with it. Yeah. So anyway, that's, <laughs> that's my, my most recent on my list choice for, for, uh, for like flaw. Deep well, flawed. it makes me happy to know that we at least have a, a werewolf. Mm hmm. A good werewolf. Worth film. watching. Worth like, yeah. Like, yeah. This director, he, he everything he does is going to be worth watching. I have a feeling he's one of those. But this is his first like big misfire, at least in terms of the trajectory he was heading. Because a lot of people think Blue Ruin was better than the Green Room. I don't like it. Was Blue Ruin and Green Room and the Green Room is a masterpiece. And then this w- could have been a step even higher forward, except for he let like. The a buddy cop writer <laughs> invade his movie for some yeah, part of it, so that is different. That is a that is a big leap though. Like a film like Green Room, and then going like a werewolf film. Like that's 
Yeah, the, the, so the, the gunfight scene is preceded by the confrontation between the local sheriff and, and the guy I was, who I was telling you about. And they talk in dorm room pot philosophy for like three <laughs> minutes. And it's completely out of place. There's like cops behind them and everyone's waiting for the showdown to, cons- to go on. And they're just talking and like, and there's some good, like there's some interesting things about class and like whatever that are going in there. But it's just like... the. the <laughs> they're they're t- it's it's so out of place because there's the standoff where people are worried about their lives and all of a sudden one of them will just turn to the other one and be like you know sometimes a wall has more corners than you think or whatever <laughs> like okay i wish that was a lie <laughs> in the film walls more corners <laughs> than <laughs> no i think it has <laughs> about as many as i normally <laughs> I don't, think i don't know so that's, well, what's your next <laughs> yeah that's so <laughs> Next one for me is, and we just, I mean, this is another very recent one. I actually, I was just going through the years going, like, what was a film that I sort of liked? My last, my last, actually, my last one was one I'm passionate about. The second to last one, uh, it could have been great. Uh, well, this one, oh, I forgot we had six. All right, I'll blast with this one, The Nun. There, I mean, all, all the comments that we're going to read at the end basically say what I'm going to say, which is you basically, it's it's like someone gave you, all the ingredients to make like a hammer horror film like to really like they like you got a lot of fog you got an old church you got a scary ass villain that was fantastic in the last film she was seen in run with it and they were like and then they just they just <laughs> fucking fumbled <laughs> really hard another writing problem another writing problem a lot of a lot of this is 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 writing because uh, most of the stuff is, is visually stunning. Right. Like there's a lot of shots in the Nun that I think a lot of people really see. Enjoyed. I was thinking a lot of this would end up being writing, but like so Dracula with great writing. So that was, and we'll see as this goes on. I know one of your choices, and I think it also has great writing. The one you're really passionate about. Yeah. So it's not always a writing problem, but these these were these two in a, <laughs> Yeah. Right. So the Nun, if Jesus. Christ. Christ. If, basically, if I, if someone said, Nick, shoot the nun, like right now, mm-hmm. like you're not, not a remake, like just how would you shoot it? And you just I, do what they did. I would just, go, I would just go to Yankee Candle. I would light every <laughs> candle and just go, <laughs> 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 and just start blowing out all the candles, <laughs> and pay like a choir to like every time I blow out a candle, just get a little bit louder. And I'm like, that's. The Nun. <laughs> that's that's the creepiness of this film when it could have been so much better. Yep. And well, I, yeah. So let, I I got to I'm gonna come to the defense. Not I'm not defending it for you, from you because you're. This is exactly your point. But when you said it, I thought, what what a like even backwards bigger slap to the face of Tom Cruise's The Mummy. Who got both of them wrong? Yeah, right. Got the writing wrong and the atmosphere wrong. Way wrong. At least this. I mean, if you took the nun's atmosphere and put it on the mummy, you fix half of the problems with yeah. that movie. Yeah, but that's what I said in our review. I said if the nuns on TV while you're putting up Halloween decorations, it's great. Right. Like it, it, the, the the setting and the atmosphere do more than I. And, and, and I think I think the score does enough to give you the creepy vibe you're going for. It's yep. just... And the acting. And the acting. Oh, my God. The acting was fantastic. Yep. It's just we we were so excited to, like, figure out, like, what Valak was about, all this other stuff, to really blame that. And then it's like... <laughs> what? The, they, it was basically like they were like the writer was eating chili cheese fries. And you're like, hey, how's that script going? And he's like, what? And you're like, dude, the script's due today. Okay. And then he just like wipes the chili. Alex in a pool. Yeah. And then he just, he just writes some shit and then hands it to you. It was it, that was that was the most disappointing part. Was I thought we were going to? And that's the thing is, I actually uh, for my next. It's actually funny. My next pick, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a little hypocritical about getting to know the villains because I think there's some villains. Where I want to know more, and I think they can really stick the landing. Mm-hmm. There's some villains I don't want to know shit about that I think keeps the character more terrifying, which sure. makes sense for my second pick. Absolutely. But the the nun, in terms of her story or character, didn't do anything, and I think she's better off in small doses, like she was in The Conjuring too. It's a great where it's sort of just like I don't know what the fuck this is. It's terrifying, and then, you know I thought that was better. So great point. Great visuals, great atmosphere, great music, great acting, story. What story? <laughs> the Nun. <laughs> the Nun. <laughs> and the Nun was another one. You're of good those. at these posters. I want to see these blurbs of the posters. But The Nun was another film, like The Gallows, made a shit ton of money. Yep. So. Yep. So 
That, I guess I mean, it doesn't need it. If movies are just products, then they're not. They're hitting yeah. home runs. Yeah, I guess you don't need it. This, I'm going to switch my order and just do the one I'm most passionate about now because I don't want to do two art films in a row. Uh, so this is the one I feel most strongly about. It's just because of the single best thing in this movie. So The Ninth Gate, mm-hmm. right, is a ridiculous movie. <laughs> Let's just be honest. It's not good. It's it's well. It's got nine gates. It's not nine. It's you got eight too one. many gates, right? <laughs> so, but it's. I mean, it's it's a ridiculous plot. The source material is pretty shoddy. It, it's it's not a. I, it, it didn't have. There's not a single thing in it I would have pointed to great if I had if I had forgotten the one thing that's great about it, right? So I couldn't have found anything else if I wanted to. Yeah. Um. It's pretty decent in terms of. The cinematography is okay. The way some of the scenes are staged, there's a great set piece that's like a, a satanic ritual that I'm going to get to in a minute that's really well done. Um, and it's got some comedy in it. It's not a horror comedy at all, mm-hmm. but it's got some comedy in it. And Johnny Depp's doing those like secret Johnny Depp things he does where he's making things secretly funny. We talked about this way on one of our first episodes about one of my favorite moments in a horror movie is when... Johnny Depp comes home in this movie and takes a microwave dinner and throws the entire fucking thing in his microwave <laughs> box and all and just hits four. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> like, which is, I mean, there's just like these little touches in it. It's, it's about a, a rare book hunter collector um, uh, with the shady side of the business, which has never been done before in a horror movie. So I find all that interesting. Um, Emmanuel's how you say her is name there a shady there? side of book collectors there is a very shady in side. real life yeah, like death and what a bunch of death. nerds <laughs> there's a there's a really I mean those, those like first edition like Shakespeare yeah, those things are millions of dollars so anytime you have like that kind of money in it I don't care I see two people <laughs> and, like, fighting over a, yeah a, like a, in a dark alley looking a, back and forth and they hand each other a book <laughs> Don Quixote yeah I don't care what it is I don't care how much money's behind it. I'm gonna point and go look at them nerds <laughs> Ah. So I mean, you've got you've got, and there's actually some really good kills. There's a, a there's a wheelchair death moment in this movie that's pretty spectacular, almost hereditary esque. I, mm. I would say. So it's got these things going on, right? It's not a great movie. It's pretty ridiculous. It's got these things, but Frank Langella, who is a unbelievably good actor played a super underrated take on Dracula in the, I think the seventies, one of the best writers of all actors. He wrote an autobiography that is like light years better written than any, and no ghost writer. This guy's like fiercely intelligent guy, mm-hmm. right? His performance is just, I, I know it's, it's, I don't even know what to compare it. it it's like watching, me play against LeBron. Like, he is the LeBron <laughs> of acting. Like, it is ridiculous how good he is. Yeah. And even when he's chewing scenery or he's, like, given lines that are that are just patently absurd, not only is he selling it, but he's doing cool little things with them and, like, whatever. But here's the thing. So this is why I picked this, because there's two amazing things that happen in this movie from this guy. And I, I, I've really not seen this before, but this movie is is is... Like it pulls like a scary movie parody trick <laughs> inside of itself, but still stays scary and serious while it's doing it, which is like juggling knives while you're on a surfboard. Like, I don't know how it did it, right? But mm-hmm. there's this amazing moment where they stage the perfect hammer satanic ritual. European mansion, weird names, European car license plates, candlelit driveways, people in black robes. It's devil rides out time. It's Christopher Lee raising the devil time. Full on pentagrams and everything, right? People cutting their wrists and putting blood and calling the devil. And then Frank Langella strolls in in a suit, just like a suit, like he's like a business guy going to lunch, right? And he, you got to replay it to appreciate the magnificence of this while they're chanting for the devil. Oh, dark father. Oh, dear. He just breaks in and goes, mumbo jumbo, mumbo That's jumbo. Like, no, like, <laughs> like, like he's totally. legit saying mumbo jumbo. Yeah, totally. Like the words totally. mumbo. <laughs> 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 yes. 
<laughs> like like mumbo jumbo as in the character from banjo kazooie yes, yes. mumbo jumbo. jumbo and they all freeze and he just strolls up and grabs their satanic bible and turns around he's like Look at you pathetic fucks. Like, what are you doing? The devil would never manifest himself to fools like you. You're old. You're silly. You're stupid. And the whole, it's like, it's like if you d- took a whole movie to lead up to like the tensest scenes, like, like that scene you love in Hereditary where the figure's hiding in the shadows. Oh, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, like whatever. You were leading up to that and then all of a sudden some guy came in and was like, no, 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 no. He just ruins the Yeah, it was amazing. And then he murders the satanic priestess who's leading the ritual with her own necklace. So he chokes her with it and the pentagram points go into her throat and he's just got this smile on his face while he's doing it. Like, so he's killing her and all the satanic ritual people are just frozen in fear. They're just watching this happen. So he kills her, snaps her neck, which you just hear this like sound and then drops her body and then everyone's frozen. Nothing's moving. The satanic ritual people are staring at him and he's staring at them. He's holding their satanic Bible and he looks at them all and he he just raises his hands and goes, boo! And they all run. <laughs> it's, you it's, think they'd be so jazzed. <laughs> They're like, it fucking worked? <laughs> right, but, and amazingly, the actual devil is helping him do this even though he don't doesn't know it. The actual devil's behind him preventing Johnny Depp from stopping it or devil's minion and 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 he doesn't know that that's happening so like there's this whole meta weird thing that's happening but it's it's the the ultimate like it 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 feels like someone who watched a whole bunch of bad horror movies staged badly with like the satanic thing or whatever and like that momo jumbo is too honest it's too honest not to be from the point of view of the people making the movie. It's got to be like yeah. that that feeling of, but it was also so ridiculous. He literally strolls in like he's just like it, it's it's like yeah, Michael Douglas's salesman. character in Wall Street just walked into a satanic ritual. It's absolutely mind boggling, right? That's a crossover. I didn't know. I wanted. <laughs> That's amazing. And then at the end of it, like when he when he actually raises the devil. It's so much more frightening because the next real satanic ritual is so stripped down. It's just Mm -hmm. him and some pages from this book and a can of gasoline. And he literally, he sticks Johnny Depp into the floor. There's a hole in the floor and Johnny Depp like falls into it a little bit. And he comes over and he puts his shoe on Johnny Depp's head and presses him into the floor until he's stuck. And his head's like two inches from the floorboards and he goes, I see you finally found your proper place. <laughs> and then he wow. goes and he does his ritual and to prove that he's now Did all Johnny powerful. Depp go, what do you mean? No, no, jo- no, Johnny Depp actually ends up really cleverly turning it back on this dude. But because what happens is he, th- this guy waves his hands in the flames of the pentagram and he's like, I'm now all powerful. I can't feel anything. And Johnny Depp's like, nice trick. T- Tony Robbins walks over coals. Show, show me something better. So then he sets, he dumps the gasoline can over himself and sets himself on fire. And he goes, "It's a, it's I'm, I'm all powerful, I'm invincible. The devil's on my side." And then you just watch on his face. Oh God, I'm on fire! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I'm on fire! He died. Like, <laughs> I feel like I saw someone in like a trailer park dies. Like they're like, <laughs> they're like, "Hey, dude, I got, I got a whole thing in Mountain Dew." Okay. You're right. It's the jackass yeah, way the to jackass. go in, in, a, in a horror movie. But but what's cool about it is there's no way he was on fire for as long as he was if the devil wasn't. It, the devil's playing with him. Yeah. He gave him like a two minute timeout from pain, <laughs> and then yanked it. So it's actually kind of horrifying and scary. And the way the whole thing ends up playing out from there is pretty great. So it's it's got like it's got this one mag. I mean, the other actors are good, but Frank Langella is giving one of the most Dr. Frankenstein-y, deluded, egotistical Claude Rains performances in a modern horror movie. And it's just sitting in the middle of this pile of ridiculousness. And I can't tell where it's on purpose or not, but it's, I fucking dig it. It's great. So, Ninth Gate. Ninth Gate. All right. This next one, I am... It almost... Like, here's the thing. I don't know why... Th- this film, to me, when I left it, was like... It reminded me of one time... When a girl broke up with me, but she was so nice about it, I didn't know she broke up with me. And I was like, wait a minute. 
Wait a minute. Wait, we're not together so, anymore? Not, we're not together anymore? <laughs> like, I <laughs> translate that feeling to, to mama. <laughs> oh, mama. Oh, yeah. That's how I felt about this film. Wow. I was like, I'm so excited. This is great. What happened? <laughs> what, what happened That's between, amazing. between the now? I'm so excited. You got Guillermo del Toro, you know, back in it and all this right? other shit. Yeah. This, is, this is great. And the short film, the short film, I think I, I prefer over the, is the, the movie itself. Sure. And, 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 you know, I was saying like with the get with the nun, like I wanted more Valak, mm-hmm. but sometimes getting more backstory isn't necessarily good. And I thought more backstory with the creature of mama didn't do it any favors, both done by Andy Muschietti. Yep. I think that's how you say his name. And I, I think him and, and Barbara are, uh, I think I got that right. Uh, yeah. Barbara Muschietti wrote it. And also a guy named Neil Cross, who was a script doctor for Pacific Rim. Which that might be where something <laughs> went wrong. Because this is another one of those things where, like, visually, Mama is fantastic. The, the creature design of her, the way she moves is great. Mm-hmm. A lot of the cinematography is great. There's that one uh, part of the film where the guy has the camera with the flash mm-hmm. and he keeps flashing it. And she sees, that's a fan. That's a scary ass scene. I mean, there's scenes from this movie that might end up in our Not Bravo's Hello Weekly Scariest Movie Countdown thing. Right? More than likely. Right. Especially that scene in particular. Yep. That's great. And and I and I even really enjoyed the, the beautiful ending of her and the other little girl sort of like, uh, uh, what is it, metamorphosis or something like that. Where like, yep. They cocooned her and then, and then they turned into Absolutely. the moss. Like, that was actually really pretty. And that yep. felt like a very del toro-esque sort of happy ending definitely my problem <laughs> my problem with it was it, it, it had jessica chastain who's mm-hmm. going to be in it uh chapter two so yes. that's 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 dope and yeah. i loved it i i, I sure. just i just think i think this is just another story issue and for me the main story of like the the new mom with the dad and then all the weird shit happening, mm-hmm. it felt sort of like a platinum dunesy mid two thousand script yeah, yeah. Totally put into that. what has like a great concept. Oh, that's a great way into to put it. that. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I, this, yeah, totally. Like, the, the story's pretty forgettable. Yep. Which, but that doesn't take anything away from the creature. No, yeah. I'm saying this like he's like my best friend. I'm like, listen, Andy, <laughs> don't be mad at me. Like, don't be mad at me. <laughs> but but that's just that's just how I felt because like I was so sure. excited. Like I loved. Loved the short film, yep. and then when I saw that the Guillermo del Toro was either producing or, yep. or backing it, or because it was Guillermo del Toro presents, yep. and he they even had him introduce the short film before they played it. I was like, this is gonna be great. And then it was just sort of like a weak saw story with like a great character, cool idea, a few cool scenes, and a fantastic, beautiful ending. But I love how you put it because that's really interesting because that means there's different breeds of what we're talking about. Which I, I'm going to be really fascinated to hear when we get feedback on the episode and people are commenting on the Facebook or emailing us or, or, or you know, on iTunes or wherever their, their feedback comes. It's going to be interesting to see what different breeds of things they come up with. Because, like, the Ninth Gate, or, or, or even, like, more important to Hold the Dark, is pretty jagged. It mm-hmm. feels like it doesn't fit at all. There's two movies at war with each other there yeah yours is so seamless that you didn't notice you got broken up with yeah like <laughs> right, like, like, right like it's not obvious until it was over yeah that, i, I that left was... the theater and like i just kind of sat there and went huh i think i think i liked you right but i don't right. think you like me right um well this is kind of a sour feeling i guess i'll just sit on it for a few few years and talk about it on a podcast that's how I felt about it. You're, you're, this is therapeutic. And what makes it, what makes, it, what makes it even harder is that, like, I think it was just like a sledgehammer of an awesome film. Like, it just blew yes. up. It was fantastic. Yep. And I think, yep. I think, I think visually, uh, Andy Muschietti is like killer. Totally. And uh, you know, so, so I, I think, I still think there's, there's something yeah. within, within it that's great. It's just, it's just the, that main story and like detective work esque type thing just felt like a plot from like a mid two thousands film and didn't really. I love how you're trying, but she's not coming back. Maybe. She's not. <laughs> she's, she's blocking me on Facebook. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go to my least lesser choice here because I, I'm gonna blitz through this because uh, there's not a lot to say about this. But I'm I will, gonna blitz to my next one. I will go to the mat for this uh, movie eighty percent. So Texas Chainsaw 3D mm-hmm. is not a wonderful movie. No. Um, it's got a lot of ridiculous timeline problems, some really questionable acting. 
Um, the weird thing about this movie is I find it super rewatchable, right? So like, I can't yeah. if it comes on, I'm just stuck. As soon as you said it, I kept thinking about the basement in that film is probably the coolest, creepiest basement out of any Texas film, right? Like, and and we because we talked about this briefly in a previous podcast. You know, I love the the cop sequence with the flashlight and the kill scene, and mm-hmm. he finds the woman in the freezer and shoots her, which is hilarious and dark at the same time. I really like Leatherface in this one. Um, and I just feel like it had some really good ideas. For, it had like the Thelma Louise character who like robbed them and a the little trickery that was sending mm-hmm. the plot astray. It found fresh ways to get people stranded in situations. And I really kind of liked the the relationship thing. It's weird because they're erasing that from like the Halloween timeline with Michael yeah. and Lori. But they they amped it up here, but I was good with it. I, I there there's a moment in this movie where Leatherface throws a chainsaw that I think is pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. I like that he chases her around an actual Ferris wheel. Yeah, combining cool. my fears of being uh, killed with a chainsaw and heights. Yeah. Like there's a lot That's, of there was a lot of one. right. There's a lot of really good stuff going on here, and then there's just just horrendously bad. Um, characters or lines or whatever. I can't... This is the one where I couldn't put my finger on what the definite great and terrible things were. It's like a fuzzy great and terrible. Yeah. (laughs) Right? There's some fuzzy great and then some fuzzy terrible. I actually really like the scene where she discovers that one of the people she thought was a good guy is a bad guy and she's trapped with him. Um, And just the way that went down because she looks super determined... And kind of like that Sawyer side in her takes over. And she, for a second, Alexander Daddario becomes the scariest thing in the movie, which I was not expecting at all. So yeah. there's like that those great the opening sequence I thought was fantastic. And then there was other some, sequences. Some shit happens. <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. So I'm not gonna go out. It's I'm just I I think it's a really rewatchable movie. I think it's one of the better Texas movies. I think it's one of the better slasher sequels pound for pound. It's just not some good overall. So. It's like I don't know how to. I'm trying to think of, a, of an analogy for, for food with that one, but I just I again yeah, with your reasoning, I can't think of one. Yeah, it's just it's, it's so it's, fuzzy. Right. It's just better than people seem to think it is. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that one. That right. basement was really creepy. That, that one. That was. That was good. Okay, so my second one. I don't have a lot to say, but it's the right the Anthony Hopkins mm-hmm. Exorcist film, mm-hmm. like. First of all, if you say the Anthony Hopkins Sir Exorcist Anthony film, Hopkins. yeah, Sir Anthony Hopkins. I have a, I have a feeling Exorcist I know film. what you're going to say is great in this movie. <laughs> yeah, like that's it, Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> right. But the sentence, an Anthony Hopkins, sorry, Sir Anthony Hopkins Exorcist film. You it, just the sound of this, the idea of that. You're like that film is going to be fire. Yep. And actually, the plot for it is not a bad. Uh, setup. It's you know, it's 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 sort of X Files E with the the believer yeah. and the skeptic, which always works. Putting those two sorts of people together in the situation where the believer's right, totally, <laughs> and, and it fucks over the skeptic. It's always in, you're always in for a fun time. Yes, but this one like it was so like I don't know. It, imagine skydive or no, no 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 hang gliding, and you take that first step off the cliff and you just go straight down. <laughs> that, that, that that is what this film is. You're like, I can't wait. To I just know. pictured Anthony Hopkins while he coyoting through the air. And it was my <laughs> that is thing ever. that is that is <laughs> that is uh, what that is. The atmosphere of the film was pretty solid. Yes, um, but everything else, like it was just so freaking. And I remember the movie being long yep. too. Yes. But the thing is, is it's a long film, and I don't remember one scene from that film. And I know for a fact I watched this movie, and I just I remember, remember one scene from the film, but it was so when she was spitting out the spikes from her mouth, like no, that was. It, I gnarly. mean, it was just the Anthony Hopkins set piece because he's just magnetic to watch. So like yeah. the whole ending where he turns evil, like whatever. But that's I let me make let me make an argument for this. I I feel like. Anthony Hopkins might have just become a huge crutch. They were like, "Yeah, here I all the that's... budget went to him, so now we can't afford a writer or special effects or whatever." But shit, we got anything happens, he'll just lecture it. Like then we'll be good. 
But you needed other things yeah, because, like, like Silence of the Lambs had all the things. Had, like, a director and a story. <laughs> and a writer and, like a and a book cast, behind it. And, yeah, exactly. Like good shit. <laughs> exactly. So the, the, the lesson of that is just because you got, like, a legendary thing piece in there, like, that can't be 98% of your budget and then fuck everything else. Like, if, if they had done something, like, with the right with Anthony Hopkins and then put it in, like, the nun atmosphere... Like, that would have been a fire movie. Like, I would have really Yeah, loved and you that. know what's weird is the Exorcist TV series, uh, Rest in Peace, that sadly got canceled from Fox, it did a couple things similarly staged to what the right was trying to do with basically unknown actors, or at least unknown in comparison to Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, and that's a gap. And way better than what the mm-hmm. right was doing, which is just kind of sad So that that was how that went down. But there's a long tradition of Hollywood of taking great actors and sticking them into cash in roles that you think this felt pull off because you know it's them so. yeah and then, but then but what makes it worse is you know you see anthony hopkins and that and you're like uh, and then he goes into westworld and crushes yeah. again so you're like it, you know it's not not him no obviously. no I'm not, obviously <laughs> not that that was ever a question <laughs> obviously it was something so like that, that that was a film that i was a little disappointed well it's with. funny that you did that because i'm gonna veer back real quickly to werewolves and bring in jack nicholson michelle pfeiffer and a wolf wow which is uh an un- a bunch of yellow eyes yeah it's uncategorized I, you can't say i can't say that word it's a movie you can't categorize it's literally it's an almost not horror, right? Even yeah. though it's a werewolf movie. Mm-hmm. Somehow it becomes an inside thriller where you're supposed to be on the edge of your seat about who's taking over a job at a publishing house, which <laughs> is just thoroughly bizarre. Um, and then the one, the one legendarily shocking thing about this movie is if you watched it, you and then were asked afterwards. You feel like it cost a buck ninety eight, but it was like a big budget blockbuster. It was like That's an eighty money. million dollar budget for this piece of crap. A lot of talent in that film. <laughs> right, that exactly, for. exactly. So it's a similar to what you were talking about, right? Like yeah. a lot of the budget got absorbed by that. But the weird thing is, Mike Nichols is a, an amazing director. He's the director of the fucking The Graduate. Like this is not. This is like this is a legend, right? Yeah, he's got some. Yeah, right. He's got cred. So yeah. you're expecting something. And here's the thing. It's a weirdly charming movie. It's 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 fun and it's got some really interesting stuff that happens. So here I'm gonna I'll isolate down on the terrible <laughs> so that because I think there's a lot in this movie that's good. So let me just I <laughs> the werewolf scene where they fight, James Spader and Jack Nicholson fight at the end. It's imagine a werewolf movie, but with no thrills and terrible special effects and staged by Cirque du Soleil. (laughs) And you have the ending fight of this movie. It's so weird how bad it is. It's just bad all the way through with the effects wise. And when you have, let me just look. So here, watch this. I got to go four deep. Watch what happens. Let me, like a lot of movies, I do this in my head. Like, let's pick, let's go four or five, go balls deep. Let's go five, you know, actors deep and see where the weakest element is. Okay, right? keep those going. So, so Jack Nicholson, amazing. Michelle Pfeiffer, amazing. James Spader, amazing. Done. You ready for the weak link? Christopher Plummer. That's the weak link. Like, this film? No, he's good, but that you're, you're, he's the fourth best performance. Like, can you imagine that Christopher Plummer is the fourth best performance? It should be an amazing movie. It should be a legendarily good movie. It's like having five Tom Brady. <laughs> and it's Tom not, Brady's tired. Right? Put in Tom Brady. Put in Tom, Tom, Brady. Just Tom Brady's tired. Tom, Put the next Tom Brady. <laughs> Just one after another. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, like it's 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 like for, yeah, now we're out of Tom Brady's. Here comes Peyton Manning. Like it's unbelievable <laughs> what's going on with the movie. So it's fun, it's enjoyable, but there are moments in this movie that are just the worst things that you would see in a movie from this budget for for this concept that have ever been done. And then there are some really really great subtle interesting things going on. And James Spader's doing James Spader dark magic, and Michelle Pfeiffer is doing like. I'm so weirdly charming. You can't figure out how I'm doing it. Catwoman shit. Like it's just an amazing. And then it's terrible. Then it's amazing. And it's terrible. So Wolf is just is a mind bogglingly hybrid movie. And because the concept of this was split. Yeah. It was. It was. That, my, that's a pretty 50 50. Totally. Film right there. All right. Hit me with your passionate one. This is your my, last one. right? This is my this is my last one. And man. Man. Did I forget how good of a movie this was. First of all. Just to get just to get out of the way, it's the Mummy Returns. Yes, which I personally think is 
probably as enjoyable, if not. Oh wow! One <laughs> percent better. This is hard for you. Okay. Yeah, one percent better. The okay. first mummy was a lot more terrifying. This yes. one was a lot more action. With a lot more silly stuff in it, sure. But but it was still really enjoyable, and they went a lot bigger in scale with what they were going for. Same, just to same get same director we established, same director Steven Somers, right? Same director. I mean, just I mean, first of all, the the bad. Let me get the bad thing out of the way. Yes, which is no surprise to anyone. It's the ending with uh, the Rock as the Scorpion King. Right, it looks bad. We all know it looks bad. <laughs> There's no. I'm not going to defend it. Like it's, it's it's shitty. Like you know, it was early. You want to? But it was it was early. It was you know it was early 2000s. <laughs> right. Like they right. did what they could. Right. But to be and now now that's the worst part. That's yes. the worst part. Then the the ending sucks with that. Okay. But the CGI in the beginning, like I showed you a scene when first of all this film opens with uh or it doesn't open, but there's a scene with a bunch of mummies in the British Museum, which is one of the coolest scenes cool. ever. I'm always down for that concept. Yeah, and in the CGI mummies uh, in the double decker bus, when they are, they don't look half bad. No, that I've, scene actually would looked really good when you showed it to me compared to what I was expecting. Yeah, so it, so it looks way better than any of that. Yep. Um, and and also you get you get pygmy mummies, which are also really great. So they take you from for that too. They, they take you from you know what you're used to of the desert type of mummy thing, and they take you to the jungle, which is which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But for me, this is like the last film because we were talking about this before the podcast. Like if you ask me, what's the pinnacle film that would represent Paramount films? For me, it would be The Atmos Family because it had yep. had the budget, had the talent, yep. had the directors. Like everything about that film felt great. Like it felt like a movie like I don't know like like it feels like that's the movie you would use the word cinema for like that like it fe- it has that that vibe to it which was great yep this film it's probably the last film that had that universal magic to yep. it um just because like like I was even watching the um right before uh the mummies come alive in the British Museum and Evie's pulling uh, like a like a bench in front of the door, and, and Brandon Fraser's like, "What are you doing?" She's like, "Trying to stop them." And he goes, "They don't use doors," <laughs> <laughs> and and they they get to the double decker bus or whatever, and then the mummies jump through the walls, which is really cool. But even in that shot, like it looked like it, the mummies look great, but rewatching it, it looked like a few dudes in a in some st- like it looked like stunt guys in a costume, but like it had, but it didn't bother it didn't bother me because right. like it looked like these right. guys were making like a big budget fun fucking movie yes and it had that vibe so it doesn't doesn't didn't bug me one bit like it felt fun they looked terrifying yeah and it looked like they were having a great time i mean there are this is going to be way throwback but there are moments that were legendary in cinema that when you go back and look at them they're they're hard cheese they're really yeah. like errol flynn shows up as a pirate swinging on a rope and all of a sudden he's on a pirate ship and he's captain blood and like you got these moments where people arrive and like john wayne will always roll onto the screen and the, he takes up the entire landscape and you know mm-hmm. it's pretty cheesy but it was also super classic yeah and and, and just the, the the settings of this film were great and there's a bunch of one-liners in this film that are that are great. Like I showed you the scene when they were on the double decker bus. The mummies, you know, their jaws unhinged and they scream, and then he just punches them in the face. And the mummy's kind of like, "What the <laughs> what the fuck, dude?" And then and then he tries it again, and he punches him again. He's like, "I was supposed to. This is my job. I was supposed to kill you." Like that shit was. It's, that was a great scene. It reminded me of my favorite Toy Story moment where. He's punching Buzz Lightyear, or when he's punching Buzz Lightyear, Buzz Lightyear's button keeps saying, Buzz Lightyear, really excited oh. <laughs> every time he punches him. Because he was punching the mummy, and the mummy was like, I've never been punched. He's like, I, 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 I don't know what to make of this. I have like a five to zero kill of death ratio. <laughs> like, I'm, this is great, but you really, you really screwed right, me up. Right, right. But all that's all that stuff was fun, and I even think the ensemble with 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 the cast is great. They introduced uh, like their little boy in the film, who is actually like he was fantastic, and. Imhotep has this like henchman who's just this tall, like big muscular dude who who has this like sassy look on his face like the whole time, which is great. And there's there's this scene when they're on the train, uh, and the kid the kid's doing that bratty thing. He's like, "Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there?" Just being a just being a dick. And the guy takes out a knife and like stabs it at him, and it goes in between <laughs> his fingers. And and my I remember my brother used to recite this line all the time because he thought it was like 
I don't. I just remember him saying it. Mm-hmm. The kid goes, "Wow, great aim!" And the guy goes, "What are you talking about?" Yank pulls the knife on. He goes, "I missed." And then the little boy's <laughs> eyes just get real wide. He's like, "Oh fuck, this guy's this guy's real serious." But it was it was it was stuff like that within the film that I thought was like it was a lot of fun. There was a few jump scares in there, but like that comes with that territory, sure. that type of film, of course. But the mummies looked great. the The action was great. The mm-hmm. fight scenes, like it felt it felt like early two thousands, like. You know, it's a little ridiculous. Like they're doing right. like cartwheel kicks and shit like that, which like I don't know if that would ever work in real life. But they, <laughs> but goddamn, love they, it to try. It. Yeah, but they, but they, but they, but they did it. And uh, also the video game for this, because uh, it was back in the day when like you know the films would come out, they'd have a video mm-hmm. game to accompany it sure. to help it. I loved that game and a website I used to go to all the time, GameRevolution.com. I think it was like one of the only Fs they ever gave to a video game. (laughs) And I never understood why. I never understood why. Because in the game, you could play as O'Connell. You could could play as Brandon Fraser's character. And like shoot mummies with guns. Or you could play as Imhotep nice. and like raise mummies from like the from the, you know from the dead and shit like that and like that to me was see super part fun. of what you got me into this franchise because I hadn't seen it before you and part of what I think really kind of identifies one of the totally likable things about the franchise especially compared to the hard fail of the the recent dark universe mm-hmm. is is exactly that i wouldn't know which i would want to do playing that game but i would definitely do both yeah in a lot of games i'll just pick one like I, mm-hmm. i'll pick i'll play the villain because it's no fun to play the hero like for the friday game came out and i was like who the fuck would play a camp counselor yeah like, like just kill people <laughs> exactly but with this i was i like both characters i like mm-hmm. both sides of the story like I, that's just fun yeah and and this was the last like it was the last film that felt like the creators were like, we have a lot of money. We're going to do everything we can with this budget to yep. make it happen. Like films don't have that, that vibe anymore. No, even not they, the, even the ones that sp- spend money, like, like water, um, they, they, like the nun was ridiculous budget, I think, and the mummy, Tom Cruise's mummy was ridiculous budget, but they still feel clench fisted somehow. Like mm-hmm. they're still s- scraping by on things or they're skimping on things. So you look at it, and you're like, what? That costs like five dollars. What the hell are you doing? Yeah, it feels it feels like they're trying to target what they're doing to please like investors yep. or to get like product placement deals or something like that. It doesn't it doesn't feel like they have the budget and they're like, well, we have it, so let's try something new. Yep. It feels like now they're like, we have the budget and the studio is requiring us to do X Y Z. Totally. So it well, I like that, that you went ride or die with Paramount's last hurrah. That's that's. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm I'll fight for. I'll, <laughs> I, I, as I still, I still think there's parts of that. There's there's more parts of this film that I think are more entertaining, which I think puts it one percent higher. Than, and the terrible elements, the ending. Okay. Yeah. It. No question. So uh, don't worry about it because I'm gonna make you look real good. Uh, with my finish because I'm going to like I have three friends left I'm glad there. you think I need help watch they're good. all gonna, no, I'm no, offended no don't worry about it because watch watch this this is going to be this I is actually gonna, have no idea what this, this is going to take care of this is going to take care of everything um, am I ready for this no you're not ready for this I'm, I'm and and I'm, I'm the cries of it's not horror are going to be heard across the land okay so personal shopper with Kristen Stewart right is, I think that's fair game. It, okay, <laughs> it's, that's it's, fair game. It's both great and terrible, and and I'm, I'm gonna do the hear me out. I'm gonna play the hear me out card here for a second because here's the thing that really, really made me want to to include this in the list, and it's because we had so much fun recently rewatching Hereditary with our group and watching the effect. So. You know, from from when the the witch dropped, which mm-hmm. magically happened in both 2016, 15, and 17 somehow, because that movie's like across, just, just did it. across three years. Did it. No one knows how that happened. But but from the kind of the inception of that kind of quiet, slow burn, weird horror, all the way through all the shit that transpired after it follows and Babadook and all that stuff. Hereditary really encapsulated both like what you is good and bad about that that kind of trend, right? Yeah. And with way more of the good than the bad. Because hereditary, that's the thing that we're discovering is when you actually watch it with people, just like a general audience, not even trying to sneer them. There are people that get really unnerved watching that movie. They yeah. get really freaked out. We were watching it, we did a watch party in the in the Facebook group. 
And there were people who were literally like turning it off. They were like, I need to work tomorrow and now I'm not going to be able to sleep if I see this. This movie's freaking me out. Yeah. There's an out of control feeling about it. Like you're in bad hands. Mm-hmm. Like someone's trying to fuck with your head, but for purposes only they know. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that evil kind of like, I, I love that when a movie can accomplish that. That's why Possession 81 is one of my favorite horror movies because that movie just feels like it's doing surgery on your brain and there's parts of your brain that aren't going to get changed but you're not in control of which ones they are mm-hmm. it's a creepy feeling right super unsettling. so of all the like all these movies came out and all of them got notoriety quiet place and it comes at night all of them got their like hurrah and personal shopper stand shoulder to shoulder with all these this movie creeped me out in the way that hereditary did. that movie really came and went right but no one knows that exists yeah. right it's literally one of the best examples of this new kind of horror and it is completely a ghost, ironically. For what it, is, right? <laughs> yeah. it doesn't exist, basically, to horror fans. And and it, that fascinates me that that happened. Now, I'm just going to be upfront about Here's the terrible element of this. The ter- I know everyone's going to be like, it's Kristen Stewart's acting. It's not. She's actually fantastic. In mm-hmm. it. The terrible element of this is this is the ultimate love or hate it movie. The only one I can think of that's worse than this, and I don't even count it because it's just bad to me, is that ghost story sheet movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because that's love or hate it, like, big time. But this is, this is a, if you, if you don't like this kind of movie, don't get within, pretend it's Chernobyl. Don't go within 80 miles of this Get movie. away from it. You will fucking hate it. But... If you have an open mind and you think that horror is a genre that should have things to say about the things that are actually scary in life, you should give this movie a chance. It's a condition movie. you got to see it in the right conditions. Turn the lights off. Get rid of the distractions. Go in with an open mind. Maybe get a little high. <laughs> like whatever. No because it's a little... Here's the thing. This is This is a really, really... It's even bleaker than you think it is. But here's the thing. This whole movie... Here's the great part. This whole movie turns on the concept of loneliness. It is one of the best uh, comments or like kind of attacks of the question of what's really scary in life. And the answer is being lonely, right? So like there will, there's times where there's just nobody there for you. Like mm-hmm. this, Kristen Stewart has a twin brother. Her twin brother's died. This is the setup of the movie. And he dies of a heart condition that she has genetically the exact same. Yeah. Right. So this could take her out in a minute. She, they, her brother died at like 23, right? So she, her job is to buy clothes for someone else that's not there, right? And this movie is, is mind-bogglingly, for most of it, she's just alone on the screen. And, and you're watching someone who is really coming to grips with the fact that there is nobody there for her. The worst things could happen to her and no one would know they happened. Wow. And absolutely gory, horrific things happen to people in this movie, which you would never know from the trailers of the market. I would, yeah, no. Like bloodshed, like bad shit goes down. And and there is nobody there to care. <laughs> Damn. And nobody there to stop it, right? And there are hereditary esque moments in this movie where she they, the, the her, her they had made a her twin her and her twin brother, because twins the the thing, right? They can feel each other's mm-hmm. pain and they know when things happen. They made a promise to each other that whoever went first from this heart condition from the other side would send a sign back. And signs start to arrive. Oof. Big time, <laughs> but and they're creepy as shit. And then there are literally moments where there's faces and things happening behind, and you don't, they don't know they're there. And there are things happening where you're there getting signs, and they don't know the signs are there. And and all this st- his stuff is playing out, and then she starts to get text messages from someone who might be a psychopathic killer. Or it might be nope. her ghost brother, or it might be someone who she's actually just working with who's fucking with her, or it might just be in her head. That is too many options. <laughs> right? And this movie goes full repulsion, like like for a big stretch of time. And at the end of it, when it resolves, th- dude, there's a scene in this movie that's so quiet and sneaks so under the radar, but there's a there's there's a horrible absolutely brutal death that happens to a character in this movie and then you cut to the security camera 
And there's these automatic doors leading out of the fancy hotel where the horrible thing just happened. And there's people going in and out and the door is going opening and closing when the people go out. And then there's no people there and you're just looking at a shot of a door. And then the door just opens and then it closes. Mm. Because someone just left. (laughs) Mm. But you don't know if it's because she's insane or someone just left. That's was that, right? And it was a hereditary moment. Like when it happened and then the end of it, I got the same feeling I got in hereditary when the creepy shit was in the background or you were finally discovering why like this accident happened and it was just as emotional and no one fucking knows this movie exists. So it's great in terms of the new trend of great. Mm-hmm. It's low budget. Like they didn't take $90 million to make a hammer atmosphere like the nun. They did it with like five. Yeah. And it's also fucking terrible, especially for the kind of person that hates this kind of movie. So that makes sense. So it's, it's, Great in what it is, and it's terrible if you are the person who hates these because it will drive you nuts. You'll feel like you just watched an hour and a half for Kristen Stewart playing with an iPhone. It, I could, <laughs> I can, I, I know the group of people who would hate that. Right, exactly. So, so that's it's got both, but that's my. I'm, I'm just gonna make a plea for it because it needed it because it's, it's. It's a good example of kind of what the best kind of horror that's happening right now that isn't the other kind, isn't the creature feature or, Mm -hmm. you know, the other like it 2017 kind. Or like we were talking about Stephen King's amazing renaissance that's happening now. Yeah, it's not like any of that. Um, So it's not like any of that. It's it's the quieter, like whatever kind. But it's also got its own great elements that that (laughs) I swear to God are there. Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I'm really excited to hear what other people think in terms of the way you frame the question to yourself is what's the first movie, horror movie that comes to mind when you think of something that's great and terrible, equally balanced? Yeah. Right? What were some of the comments on the Facebook group? Let's yeah, yeah. Let's so like, so I pulled it up because we had some really, really cool answers and I appreciate all the people who do- dove in with these. Um, so Aaron Long said, vacancy hella comes to mind. Um, fun concept, terribly executed, <laughs> but entertaining for what it is, especially when you have no one to root for. I like that little yeah. twist he put there at the end, right? Um, we got, uh, Garen said, Exorcist 3, because he's the, it's all over the place with characters, pacing, and story, but legendary scares. Mm-hmm. Fair. Um, R.C. Martin said, Jason goes to hell, some of the best glorious kills, but why did they throw in all that mythology right at the last moment? Which is, (laughs) and then my favorite comment here, because I thought this was really interesting. I wouldn't have thought of it this way, but the more I read it, the more I thought, yeah, I can totally see that, was uh, Lindsay Thompson said, Devil's Advocate. Mm -hmm. Great story, great FX, great cast, shit acting. (laughs) And it's interesting because... Like Charlize Theron, Keanu Reeves, Al Pacino, you're expecting great acting like mm-hmm. around every corner. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, all of them phoned it in. What was going on there? That's like must uh, have just been that year, <laughs> right? Like exactly. we're really tired. Um, uh, Harry Holler said, "House never understand how practical effects can be so great and so awful all at once." It's the how they did it, which is yeah, and then. Matthew Collins, I love this answer. Not a movie, but an anthology show. Castle Rock's first storyline was fantastic. It's a great show, horrible way to cinch the final episode's ending. I don't agree. I actually really like the ending, but I love that that's where his brain went. I love yeah. that it went to a TV and not that. And I, I totally grant that the, uh, there's definitely possible that the ending could suck. I could watch that 10 years from now and be like, what was I thinking? So um, we had a lot of people with the nun. Yeah, that was a popular, that was a hot one. The one that got the most likes in the group was Signs. That's interesting. Spooky setting, but water hurts aliens. I think we all know what's the worst part of that movie. Yeah, yeah. So, and then sure. he said something like, why didn't they burn up in the atmosphere? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. House on Haunted Hill remake from 1999 from Peter Blewett. Uh, has some genuinely creepy moments. Atmospheric as hell, but the third act is just really shock, shocky and dumb. Which is fair. Um, Ed Barr brings up The Terrifier, which I haven't seen yet. Great throwback to 80s slasher films, but had a nonsensical and inconsequential character that did nothing for the storyline. Yeah, Um, that makes sense. Which totally makes sense. 
Cynthia went way out on a limb here. This is blue. What's the purple heart for group bravery? Event Horizon. That I I, I saw that. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this might not be popular. She starts, but Event Horizon, stellar cast, beautiful FSX, and a story that falls apart. That's interesting because. I don't know if it's a story that falls apart or the actual people. Yeah, fall I apart. think the people fall apart pretty hard. <laughs> right? Sam Neill straight. No and then eye in Tony it. Um, went against hold my hold the dark. Um, he actually liked that it had that abstract, ambiguous thing that was. I think it's the philosophy of it that was bothering him more. But he hasn't been able to hear the episode yet. He went with a nominated Hereditary. Looked great, cool cast, but ultimately pretty derivative with all the silly supernatural conspiracy stuff. It's an interesting take on that because I think a lot of people feel Hereditary was like really original, but it also leans super heavy on Rosemary's Baby and some other horror influences. So that's a really interesting yeah. uh, take, but a great answer is coming out of the group. I love I love the stuff they put in there. Those are fantastic. And if there were some answers that you didn't hear, let us know on the Facebook page. We'd love to know what you think. And it's October, so you know what that means. I do. It means you gotta do all the Halloween shit. I'm yes. telling it. I'm telling you. If you do all, I mean, if you do any cool Halloween stuff like Gatsby's doing, he's investigating right now, <laughs> Ninth Gate style. That's right. Oh, and he's up Dude, on the that table. That bell is joining the. Podcast all right. If you hear that bell, it's not. It's not the wailing bell. This There's no creature Halloween behind cat. you. It's just Gatsby investigating. Uh, do all the Halloween stuff. Let us know what you're doing and uh, watch all the scary movies you can. And until next time, stay scary. I guess.